Thank you very much. Um, thank you for inviting me. This time I'm, I'm talking about uh, the difference between science and product because it's one of those things that bothered me for a lot of my working life was trying to understand the relationship between these two. Um, the, you will need to know this because wherever you go from here you will either be going into industry or you will be going into uh, research and from both of those perspectives to, n to have an answer to this is useful for you and is worthwhile I hope. So let me try and give you a little bit about what I've learned. Um, why should you care about research in universities or what business is like? Because the, the two of those things seem to be rather strange bedfellows. So universities go, go ahead and they do their research because they're interested in it. And uh, businesses go ahead and they make their products because they're interested in making money. But the two have a relationship or should have a relationship. Let's face it, government is putting a lot of money into research and it's expecting some kind of return on that money. EPSRC in the UK uh, puts £1 billion a year into research programmes across all of its, uh, its disciplines. That's a lot of investment. And what does it expect? What it expects is that there will be some sort of commercialisation value which is going to change, which is going to convert into employment, which is going to convert into GDP. Which it's GDP which funds government activities, which is the buses and the roads and uh, uh, the schooling and everything else like that. So it's putting that billion pounds a year in for a very good reason, and that is it wants to see a return. <coughs> Business, on the other hand, isn't terribly interested in good uh, ref um, reports saying how good the value of your research is. What business is interested in doing is converting it into money. It's converting what it knows into something that people will buy profitably so that that money can go back to its investors. So these two seem to be very, very isolated. But the problem is that government agencies, if they don't see the exploitation happening, will cut the funding. They, will, they won't spend a billion pound a year on research if there is no noticeable exploitation of that research. And similarly, it means that businesses are not benefiting from that billion pounds of investment that the governments are putting into research activities because the research activities don't connect to business. If you've got a business and it's able to exploit the research value or a large part of it, then it should be a more competitive business worldwide and that's what matters. So wherever your career takes you from here, it will take you into one of those environments and that's where this hopefully will become a good lesson to you. Now I'm going to go back in time even before me. This is just to say about the exploitation of science because we tend to think of it as always being like, it's, like it is today. The world isn't always like this. 35,000 years ago, which sounds like a big number until you realize that the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, so 35,000 years ago, Cro-Magnon man emerged from the evolutionary pipeline. We came out of, the, out of that evolutionary process 35,000 years ago. Our mission, if you like, at that point was to survive. And that technology was the technology that we used for more or less 35,000 years just to survive. Finding food, keeping shelter, and that's, that, that had us there. The philosophers, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Archimedes, they didn't make an appearance until only 1,000 to 2,000 years ago. So uh, 32,000 years we lived in mud huts, 2,000 years ago we started to think a little bit more about what nature might be. The mission then of those guys was to understand a little bit about the stuff that was around us. The scientists only appeared around 1,000 years ago. So here we've got Galileo, Descartes, um, William uh, Gilbert, uh, discovered electricity. 
So only 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, was science starting to appear. And this was manipulation of nature. So using nature for something that wasn't growing or something that wasn't already there. We still haven't got to exploitation though. And that happened only 250 years ago with the Industrial Revolution. Now, the, the, effectively, this is the emergence of the engineers. The engineers took around a thousand years of science and exploited it, i.e. they brought it to a customer who was prepared to pay some money to actually have it. So they created the first science business. And the first science businesses had an awful lot of history of science to base their activities on. So this is not science which has only come about in the last couple of years. It was science that had come around, come about in 250 years. <clears throat> and it was that that created the first technology-based businesses. And it was that that established this pipeline, research, develop, produce, which we've now squeezed into a time scale of 10 years, maybe less for an awful lot, but it, this is something that happened historically over a long period of time, but it's part of the reason why people believe that research is important for developing product, because it was technology's big bang. It was the explosion of the exploitation of science which had been acquired over thousands of years, which was the thing which changed society. And I'll emphasize that the population of the world prior to the Industrial Revolution was one billion. It had been more or less flat at one billion for as long as people could remember. The growth, the population growth rate was one percent, sometimes rather less than that. After the um, Industrial Revolution, it became two and a half percent. And it stayed at that growth rate ever since because the revolution is not a static thing, it has to keep on happening. So this, the Industrial Revolution still happens, but it now means that if you assume that the basic support capability of life on Earth is around one billion people, then six out of seven people in this, in this room are only here because of science. And if we lose that science, then of course we will go back. So to, to look at business you have to look at what people need and back in 1972 Pioneer 10 that spacecraft carried a plate a gold plate off into the universe there was a lot of controversy about this because that's all that the plate contained but it said so much about us it said that we were big brained we were dexterous, we had forelimbs which have been chosen, which have evolved to be able to manipulate things. We had a perception of time because we were sending this thing out into the, into the universe. And of course, it showed that we were incredibly weak, that these two naked pictures didn't have claws or great big jaws. We had to depend on being clothed in something to be, to be able to achieve uh, what was our potential. And our potential as a space race had, was obviously significantly greater than, uh, than the raw features. Now there was a lot of controversy about it at the time because when in 1972 this was launched people started to look at that plaque and say hey we're telling anybody who finds this an awful lot about how vulnerable we are. Of course there was nothing we could do about it. By then it was already making its way out beyond planets. But one thing that, that had happened in many ways was this guy. And I don't know if, um, if you know Maslow's triangle of, or hierarchy of needs, Maslow's triangle. Um, but it's a useful thing to bear in mind because nobody's really disputed this. There's some arguments about exactly where the barriers occur. But essentially these are the things that humans are prepared to pay for the lowest levels of which, food, water, warmth, rest, security, safety, are the things that people are prepared to, to pay the most for. The things at the top of the uh, triangle 
which are self-actualization stuff. This is kind of spooky things that you have. It's your smartphone when you don't really need the, smart, the latest variety. It's the, it's the things that you're, which are, I think you'd call luxuries. Humanity is not really prepared to pay for luxuries until it's got the lower levels of that triangle established. So you can always, if you're trying to sell a product, if you can sell a product which satisfies a need in the lower levels, and if, if you can make people feel insecure enough that they are not catered for by those lower levels, then you will sell your product. It's a good product. Whereas if you're only selling something which appeals to a luxury market, your great big motor cruiser, your big fancy uh, chalet on the mountains in Switzerland, then obviously those come along when the people feel they've got enough spare money on top of the basic living. If you want to contact, if you want to sell to the basic, to the largest community, then you want to appeal to their lowest level instincts. So health and security, for example, are two issues which are pretty big in the markets at the moment. People want to live forever and they want to feel safe when they're doing so. And products which are aimed at that are likely to get a lot of attention. Now, because we need almost everything, it's interesting to look at this. The things that we need have either got to come from our own ingenuity, a personal ingenuity, and to a certain extent that's where we started banging rocks together and carving pieces of wood, um, or from that of others. And so cooperation was a human evolutionary feature right from the beginning. We had, although we were very weak, we had got, we had evolved with ingenious brains. We had bipedal, bipedal posture, which is really great because if I was a four-legged creature, it would be a lot more difficult for me to hand wave and gesture than it would be that I, the way I'm set up. And also the, the nature of our fingers means that we're able to do fine manipulation type work. We have evolved with that. We have evolved with good hand-eye coordination to manipulate things and a perception of the future. If I, do the, if I bang these rocks together now, if I bend a piece of metal, if I heat something, then it will be better for me in the future. And trade, therefore, and money as a token of work done was an inevitable evolutionary partner to humanity. So money, business, and people to get the benefits of the clothing that we need to do various jobs or the tools that we need to do various jobs became evolutionary partners. We mustn't ignore business, it's part of who we are. And we mustn't ignore money because it's also part of who we are. And I think that this is a point worth, worth remembering. Here we are in the 21st century, we feel very superior, we feel very above all of that worldly stuff. And yet, I remind you, when you go home, when you go to bed, when you get in the bath, you are still that vulnerable naked person. You still depend on being able to get those things to clothe you and to feed you. And so Maslow's triangle hasn't changed. 1943 still applies today. Now people buy functions, not technology. You've all got some of these things in your homes, in your offices, in your pockets. And you've got them not because of the technology that's inside them, but because of the functionality that they, they provide for you. A smartphone is a very interesting one because it extends your memory, it, it, because you can take pictures with it, uh, you can write things down on it, which is also an extension of memory. You can communicate at a distance, which is the action of a phone, so it extends your ears and extends your mouth. Most of the functions that a smartphone does is to extend the functions of, of, of the basic human, to enable us to, to move faster. We have cars, uh, but these, the, uh, essentially everything that we do is to enhance what we value as human beings. Not all of the products that we buy are real. Some of the products that you get when you get a, uh, a smart card or when you go to a hospital or indeed when you plug something into the wall and you get power or turn on the tap and you get water or go to the supermarket and you get food. Not all of the technology that you're buying is visible. But nevertheless it's there. The reason that you can have a cup of tea and a biscuit is phenomenal. You've got to have the water, you've got to have the tea, 
you've got to have the materials that go into the biscuit, you've got to have the ceramics, uh, the technologies associated with all of those. The cup of tea is very much taken for granted and yet actually represents quite a pinnacle of industrial achievement. So, we'll talk about business for a moment then. It's about making money, it's not a charity. Now, businesses are generally tend to be criticized for not concerning themselves about their employees too well, about concerning themselves only with making money for their investors and not for everybody else, about making uh, undue payments for their senior executives and making much less ones for, for people who are working on the floors. You have to remember that businesses are there primarily to make money. It's not a charity and those other things that are um, supposed to be, let's say, considered within society are things which have to be considered by our governments. So the people who make money pay taxes and the taxes go to support all of those other infrastructural things in, uh, in society. And asking businesses to do this is something which we have to be a little bit careful of. It's about using technology or employment. It's not about technology or employment. <clears throat> so technology is a part of these products but is never a product on its own right. You have to remember that if you're interested in research, you're interested in science, you're interested in technology, but people, which is you when you go home, don't buy technology, you buy products, you buy functionality. A smartphone is a wonderful piece of technology, but it doesn't work without the environment to put it in. A car is a wonderful piece of technology, but it needs roads, and it needs a fueling infrastructure. And it's, the provision of those is part of what you buy when you buy a car. So business, because technology is only a product enabler, then businesses only adopt new technology when doing so gives it a market advantage over its competitors. So it's a war out there, and we'll come back to that in a moment with some details of it. But businesses are in competition with businesses. And it's the, it's the winner that survives and generally the losers die. <clears throat> now business investors are risk averse. They want to lend you some money to do this wonderful thing that you've been talking about in business. But they don't actually want to risk their money. They just want to, to uh, uh, get a return on that investment. Now, just because that's what they require doesn't mean to say they always get it. But nevertheless, as an objective, and when you bear in mind that the money that they're investing might very well be your pension fund, then you want them to be secure with that investment. You want them to make good bets. In other words, you don't want them to back technology fancy ideas which have got absolutely no product opportunity, no commercialization opportunity. Uh, you have to be either two-faced about this or to recognize the real world. The research that you're doing has got to link in some way to a product in the future because if it isn't, it's a total waste of time. And you will want people to be investing your investments sensibly and that is essentially not investing in what research you want to do. So be very careful about that. The other thing is company directors are legally responsible for looking after the money which is lent to them, which in, essen in essence means they're not allowed to take risks. So if you want a business and you want to have money to run that business, then businesses have to conform to the rules. And then the other thing is new technology may be game-changing to some businesses, but may be totally irrelevant to others. Graphene. Everybody heard of graphene and everybody's heard, read the press that says how wonderful it is and how it's got all of these potentials and yet nobody is making a fortune out of it. Uh, at the moment that's a technology which is not relevant to every business. Now it might be that in a year or two's time some business will come up which is exactly what graphene was waiting for and it will become a game changer in that but it may never happen. There are plenty of technologies Plenty of sciences which started out very promising have got absolutely nowhere today. <clears throat> the laser was in that category for many years until people eventually found that there was things that you could do with it. And now, of course, the laser is in almost everything. 
Uh, any kind of hard disks uh, is are using laser technology today, and of course all panel lights and so on are LEDs. So laser technology gained its feet, but sat for a very long time uh, without anything, without any business opportunities to exploit it. The other thing to bear in mind is that businesses may have safer ways to achieve the same outcome. So if I could use a new technology to do this thing, or I could use an old technology in a different way, then it may be using the old technology in a different way is safer. And business is not about taking undue risk, it's about being a little bit better than your competitors, just a little bit better. <coughs> so we're going to go on to this graph which will start to appear in a number of places <coughs> through the rest of the presentations. But the first thing I'm going to do is talk about the phases of business, of which I've listed three of them up there. The first phase of business is the startup phase. Now all companies, including the baker on the corner, the sweet shop, um, as well as the high-tech businesses, the car companies, they all have a startup phase. They all have a growth phase and they all have a maturity phase. It's, it is the nature of business. Now some of those businesses will have been in the maturity phase for many years. Um, they don't notice that they ever had a startup phase or a growth phase, but I'm now generalizing. All businesses have a startup somewhere. And when that company is formed, it's formed to deliver something. Formed to deliver something to an end customer, uh, because it's only when the end customer gives some money that money flows back down that chain to fund all of the activities which are involved in it. Initially, that company has got the fewest people in it that it can possibly have, which, shall, which is big enough to allow it to achieve what it wants to do. So essentially, everybody is irreplaceable. So they're there for a reason. They're focused on the product deliverable, not just on engineering, but all of the marketing and the documentation and the support services or whatever else is going to be needed. They have to produce, along with the engineering. Everybody knows the risk, though. Everybody has an identified role in the machine and is critical to the customer's su company's survival. If one of them gets run over by a bus or has a skiing accident, it can put the, the startup business out of business, just like that. <coughs> Technology and knowledge came with the group. So you can think that the research activity was over there to the left. The research activity happened before startup. What they came in was a package, which is already there, and it was in terms of exploiting it. It has no time at that point for what-ifs. It's a case of do, do, do. Now anyway, assume your company goes on a little bit and it actually survives and it actually delivers the first product to that first customer. And the, and the first customer was kind of interested in this. He liked it, was prepared to pay money for it. All of a sudden you're in a growth phase. It follows on from the first phase, it has to. What happens at this point is the people who were originally in the company, the people who created that company, have to move to marketing, sales and business roles. Because we're now in the business of producing the next generation something, or lowering the cost, or improving the quality. All of the sort of things which go along with the second phase of, uh, of a business's opportunity. And the other thing is, that business realizes that it's vulnerable. It's vulnerable to individuals. It doesn't want to have that susceptibility to people being run over or falling down a, a crevasse. It wants to be able to survive that. And so it starts to introduce additional people and it starts to introduce procedures. Procedures are the bane of industry, and yet you can understand why. It's necessary to have two or three people that know how to do your job, which means that you're not, you're not in the leverage position that you once were, but from the company's point of view, it means that it can survive if you fall under a bus because there are two other people who know how to do your job. So organizations start to build in redundancy. They rationalize what they do. They don't waste time doing things which were unnecessary. They focus very much more on the product that's in there. They're still mostly about adapting what they know. So it's a market that they know. It's a product that they know. They're not terribly interested about taking new things during that time. 
Um, they've employed more people, which is good, and they've progressed, which is good. Now anyway, success breeds success, and you end up getting beyond the growth phase, phase into the maturity phase. Maturity is essentially keep turning the handle. This is the, this is the phase where thinking isn't really encouraged. What you're actually encouraged to do is to improve yield, improve productivity, reduce costs, employ cheap people rather than expensive people, and that means proceduralize everything. So everything in the company now is, everybody in the company is now replaceable. That company can survive. We've got families, we've got mortgages, we've got dependents, and the investors want to be secure too. And so this is a dangerous position, but it's, which is why I also call it cruising. This is where a business is cruising along. They don't have to think too much about anything except turning out the objects. <clears throat> and now the fourth phase, demise. Let's not be politically correct about it. Let's call this death. All businesses face the prospect of death. If you're a business which is too big to fail, a government organization, which includes universities and hospitals, then in many respects you are all too big to fail. You can't be allowed to fail because there are people coming through that process. Government has to maintain it. But in business, you can be allowed to fail. So if your competitor is better than you, he produces a product which is better quality, which lives longer, or is even a color that people prefer, then you will lose the market lead and you will die. Because if you haven't got your product leading the market anymore, then you're struggling to exist. And so all businesses die when the disruptor hits you. And there's a book reference there, which is The Innovator's Dilemma. You can have a copy of all of these slides, so you don't have to try and write it down. It's well worth reading, and it's The Innovator's Dilemma has a subtitle, Why Big Businesses Fail. And it's uh, worth bearing in mind, there are no businesses which are truly businesses which are not fighting on a daily basis to survive. <clears throat> And most businesses are unaware of the fact that they've got these phases. They're unaware of the fact that they are in these phases because businesses are like bumblebees. Bumblebees don't need to appreciate the laws of aerodynamics to fly. They just put their wings out and flap them and they fly. And it's the same with businesses. These businesses have grown up around an idea. They have become bigger than they were. They've not consciously moved from one of these phases to another, but they have moved. And if you stand on the outside, they're fighting to survive, but they don't realize that that's what they're doing. But they are fighting to survive. So graphs, enough words for a moment. That's what you hope a business is going to do. It's going to start somewhere down here. Its revenue is going to climb. And then, of course, the worrying part at the end is some time down that line. So it's not got a linear time line at the bottom, like linear time scale. Each of these can be small or large. But the demise part is there, and when demise happens, your revenue goes down is the first thing that business notices. Now, also, if you've got a good product, a good idea, then you get competition starting to creep up on you. But that's not usually too much of a problem, because they've had, that as a running business, they're usually two or three years ahead of their competitors. They've also had the opportunity to develop their product into its next generation. They've done some optimization on it. They've done some improvement in the production process. So the comp competition is there. It nibbles away at a bit of your market, but it's not huge. The thing that happens is this disruptive in uh, in innovation. And it comes from the competitive field. So there's somebody in the competitive field who you've been able to ignore up until now because they've been working on something and you look down at what they were working on and you're thinking it's not relevant to my business not serious competition but then they rise from the, from the masses going like a rocket and this is the the thing that the innovators dilemma book talks about they're not appreciated until they are a threat and by the time they're seen as a threat it's too late to do anything about it so these are the opportunities then for feeding research 
into a business like that. And I call it openness. It's openness to, to change, openness to, to information, openness to input from outside. And you can see that the openness is high before the business really gets going during the early phase of the startup. And it's high over here. Anybody guess why it's high over here? Because that business is dying. It needs something to fill the space. It needs, an, it needs to discover how it can compete with that disruptive innovator. It is clutching at straws. It's a dinosaur which is extinct, but it hasn't realized it yet. So a business which gets to a point where that dis disruptive innovation surprises it is a business which is desperate for research outcomes, but is totally the wrong people that you should be talking to. Because if you're providing good quality research and you're hoping it's going to be exploited, they're looking for something which is going to be able to be delivered to the customer inside a year to two years. Your products, your science is never going to be that. So a thinking company actually invests in research before there is, they've lost their competition. And they're able to reinvent themselves before the disruptive innovation happens. A thinking company is a good company to work with, but it means that when you, taking your research to, uh, to industry, when you approach that company, you need to know who in the company you're actually talking to. Are you talking to somebody who's thinking about the future, or are you talking about somebody, to somebody who is looking for a solution to today's problem? Because if you're talking to the wrong people with your, with your research, with your science, with your technology, then you will not get, you're not actually getting into a relationship with the business that you want. From a business point of view, looking at it from the other side, if you're cruising along in that business, then you need to be encouraging the business to start thinking about external research relationships. And it's a difficult one because this business, this business is comfortable. Everything about the business is going fine. And you're telling them it won't be like that. There will be an end. You need to start researching now because you need to be able to reinvent yourself before the problems hit. Believe me, I've stood on that side of the fence and tried to explain it for years. It is very difficult. But if you take that message out with you, it's going to be a good start. <clears throat> So there is only a limited times when a company is open to external input and they need different things at those times. So why do you need a new product anyway? Um, if you're a comfortable, mature business um, and you know what you're doing and you know your customer base and they're stable, your competitors are stable and tolerable, and you're making enough money to, for all of your stakeholders to be happy and your market is going to be stable for long enough. And if you're a baker or a, street sh a, a sweet seller on the corner of a, in a corner shop, an awful lot of those things are perfectly good forever. You can run that business, retire, let the business die. You're not bothered. You don't need a new product. Your product is the product that you're selling. But if you're a business where any of those things are variables, which is most of the technology business, then you have to have new products. Surprisingly, not all technology companies have a, a development department. I was talking to a guy a few years ago who made a communicator for the pillion passenger to talk to the driver on a motorcycle. It was a one transistor amplifier, a microphone and an earphone, two of them. He got the circuit from a uh, practical electronics magazine oh, about 20 years before. And he'd been making that circuit for 20 years, and he'd been quite, running himself as quite a successful business. And I came into contact with him because it was an innovation contest, and the university graduate had uh, come out for um, an internship, and he'd worked for six weeks with him. During that time, he'd replaced the one transistor circuit with a 741 op amp, and it had changed the quality of this circuit phenomenally. The guy was over the moon about this. It was a new product range for him. He could replace the existing one. There was still a continuous call for a communication between the, uh, the, between the driver and the pillion passenger on a motorbike. Not all businesses are like that, but he had no development department. He got himself a new product very easily. <coughs>
But for the, predominantly, businesses exist to make money out of what's already known. So they don't want to take on a new technology or employ more people just for the sake of it. If they can use what they've got in a different way, make it more profitable, make it more easy, make, and profitability is not just about f reducing the number of components in the circuit. Profitability is about improving the yield of the circuit. It's about simplifying the testing. It's about simplifying the manufacturing process. Uh, it's also about improving the marketing. All of these things are part of what separates a technology object from a product. And you have to bear that in mind because a product is something that a business delivers and that's the package of all of these things. And you as technology developers or technology people who will be involved in the life cycle of this have got to realize that your technology is never on its own. It's always part of a product and that is if it's successful. <clears throat> so another point that tends to get overlooked is that products are done with the aim of disrupting your competitor's market. There's an awful lot of products which come up this way and then when they disrupt the market they haven't actually got any business plan for taking over 50% of the market let's say of a company which is already a, a billion dollar company. So you can't to, to disrupt a competitor's technology is not to disrupt a competitor's market and a lot of companies fail even though they've got a good technology solution because they haven't looked at the business consequences of succeeding. So we return to this one now. Businesses need investors and investors need businesses to remain focused. And look at this why, because we've got the, the um, revenue curve now dotted, we've got the flexibility curve just for completion. But what I'm going to do now is say this is the net worth of the company. So this is what happens in those first few months. Before you've got any revenue to speak of, you're spending money. That money comes from investors. When you get your first revenue into the growth phase, you're probably still not recovered. You've still not paid back what you took taken from your investors. That's assuming you're a successful company. It can take years to recover break even. Those investors want you to succeed. They don't want you to be distracted. So if you're, you're contributing technology and you come from a university research background, um, and you're setting up this startup and you're not committing 100% of your time to doing it. So, for example, if you want to be a lecturer and, a start and run a startup company, then the investors will say to you, hang on a minute, if you're not prepared to commit to this, we're not going to give you the money. They want you to have skin in the game. Now, the reason is an awful lot of companies do that. They get a debt, they get money from the investors, but they don't actually, the investors don't see a return or it's very much further down the road than it was expected. Remember, that's your pension fund that we're talking about there. And some figures that I've able to, been able to come across, not terribly reliable, but it does seem to suggest that only about 1 in 20 startups actually ever break even. Only one in a hundred to two hundred ever make more than a million dollars, a million pounds worth of revenue. So most startups fail, is the, the thing to bear in mind. And investors don't want them to fail. Investors want you to have skin in the game. They want you to, sh to be convinced about the uh, invulnerability and the wonderfulness of your investment. They want you to mortgage your house. They want you to mortgage your wife and kids. They want you to have skin in the game because that way they know that you believe you're in this as well. Now products advance by very small competitive steps. So we could have gone from this back in the 70s to this today in one step. We could have gone from that, the first integrated circuit, to that, a relatively modern one, in one go. That's got eight transistors on it. That's got around eight billion transistors. We could have done, but we didn't. And the reason for that was it had to be a commercially viable product in the meantime. That meant that they had to move by stages, not by big leaps. And so it took years to do that transition, and it will take years because every one of them has to be a viable commercial step. You sell an improvement because of something that it offers the end customer.
And when the end customer is satisfied with it, they buy some, money flows back down the chain to, to, to justify further work. So successful businesses supply what their customers need. So we've got there the Maslow's triangle, which is good to help you to, to try and understand what customers need. But the other thing that happens frequently is that somebody is selling the idea and somebody is buying something and they're actually looking for something totally different. So the guy is looking for something to open a tin of paint, the other guy is selling this new wonder product that he's got. They both call screwdrivers. They have different functions in mind. And a product includes not only its implementation, but all of the things that's necessary to use it. So you can use a product, like on the left-hand side, when you've got no power. You can't use the screwdriver product on the right-hand side unless you can plug it into a charger somewhere. If you're going to plug it into a charger, then you can't take it uh, away from mains power supplies. Uh, it's just not viable. And so there's a lot of environmental aspects which relate to this. There is also another thing is that you need to be able to produce these things. A screwdriver is a fairly easy thing to produce, a bit of wood and a bit of metal, a little bit of shaping. But to produce the other one, you've got batteries, you've got electric motors, you've got plastic molding, all of which have to come together. And of course, you need to have support activities for that. Screwdrivers fairly easy, hammers fairly easy, nails and screws don't need much by way of uh, support departments, but the other one does. Documents, tools, methods, the cost of installation, the non-recurring the non engineering costs, you'll remember that acronym, NREs, it crops up very frequently. How much is it going to cost to set this thing up? Now, if, it, if, it, if you're going to take machinery and a factory that you've already got and modify it ever so slightly to make a new product, that's a totally different thing than setting up a brand new factory, having to build the building, install the power, the phone lines, and the equipment necessary to produce this thing, then it obviously makes a lot more sense to move from where you are into a nearby product than into something totally new. <clears throat> so if the customer turns out to, actually, to not actually want the thing that you've sold him, then you can be very disappointed. And if your business is dependent on that, then that can be the very final nail in your coffin. You expected to sell this product to this guy because he wanted millions of them. And you don't sell it because you misunderstood what he actually wanted. So if you, oversold your if you oversold your technology as a research community to a business, believe and the business believed that it was going to get a totally different thing from you, then that relationship will be spoiled forever. The relationship will be spoiled forever because the business might very well go down, but if the business goes down, the individuals are still there. Those individuals move into other businesses because they have transferable skills. And those other businesses say, sorry, those people in the other businesses say, don't go near universities because they oversell what they've got. So your relationship will be spoiled with industry. It's, the onus is on you to talk the truth both ways around, business to industry and uh, business to uh, research communities and research communities to business. But that tends to suggest that industry doesn't need research. Well, it does. It needs, to, it, it needs research to establish the path before it has to walk down it. If there's nothing else to remember, that's a message which should come back out, out of these slides because it applies to both communities. The research community is there to help business to go down a path before it needs to go down the path. And the industry needs to have research there to help it to understand the path that it's going to go down. It's a partnership. Business needs technical research to establish the tools and the methods and the technologies that it will need to use in its next products, not in its current ones. It knows it's got a next product if it's a business in the uh, in the uh, cruising mode, it knows it's got an X product, it doesn't know what it's going to be. You need to help that business to understand what, it need, what its next job product will be and also what skills it's going to need to acquire to deliver it. So it needs to lay the framework for the introduction of new technologies in that mid-term, not the technology in the product that it's already got. 
And it's the technology across the whole border. So it's performance, it's risk, it's cost, it's staffing, it's manufacturing tests, conformance, support, maintenance, legal and regulatory is all part of getting a product out. And if you can help in some of those parts, for example, a piece of new research that you come out, come out with, you show it to industry, industry loves it, and asks you, what's the patent position on this? It's more concerned about whether you've infringed another patent to do that research product. Because if you have, it can't use it. It's too risky. To investigate is too, is too risky because generally you haven't got much time to investigate either. It also needs what you'd call non-technical research. This is business, business support things. What tools should I be using to make my business more efficient? To understand my customers better? To keep a record of the contacts? To, to, uh, to better calculate my production costs? All of these things are boring spreadsheet type materials, but nevertheless are necessary. Email only a few years ago didn't exist. How would business be today without email? How would you communicate today without social media, without email? And yet businesses manage perfectly well for those two and a half thousand years or the 250 years since the Industrial Revolution. They manage perfectly well without those technologies. It just limited the products that they were making. But they were still able to be competitive because it limited the products that everybody was making. As we move forward then, we have to look at how these technologies, these, these social technologies, if you like, impact business. And you can help business by doing that, uh, by helping to un them understand how their business process will benefit. And it's not just good enough to say, you should be using YouTube or you should be using uh, Facebook. Uh, those are probably two bad examples right now, but the world has moved on and you have got to be able to say, if you used YouTube like this, it could do this thing for you. If you use Facebook like this, it could do these things for you. And it's, uh, it's more specific than just the general try this and try that button. <clears throat> I'm not sure what that word is at the top left. Something your research outcomes to business see. Okay? We'll have to look at the slides later to discover that word. Because end products incorporate many technologies, people tend to talk about a smartphone as being a technology product. Well, it is a technology product, but it's multiple technologies that go into there. There's glass, there's RF, there's analog, there's uh, digital. There is computer science, there is electronics, uh, there is shaping metal, there is plastics. There's a lot of technologies inside a product. It's not just one technology. Society tends to use the word in the singular. You are not society. All of you in this room are trained engineers or scientists or will be. That puts you in a different, in a different class to the rest of the untrained scientific world. You will need to understand things at a depth that society in general will not understand. And that one of the things is technology is not a single thing. Communications is not a single thing. These are groups of things and there is, a, uh, there is boundaries within it. So when you're selling your science to a business, that might be your science. DC brushless motors, rare earth magnets, lithium ion batteries. But you'll have to sell to a common vision, a vision which the customer, the end customer of those things can appreciate. It's not the motor. The motor is impressive. You couldn't make the electric drill without it, or the batteries, or the magnets. And yet the thing that you have to work towards is that big end product goal, which means that when you're selling your technology, you have to understand how that technology is going to be used or could be used to make an end product. It's not a little silo that you can sit within and say, I'm doing my bit. It's a, it's a thing. I have got this technology. It could go into motors which are going to be compact and powerful. You could use it for something like an electric screwdriver. The other guy goes, an electric screwdriver? What is that? And, but you can soon develop a common image of that. But it does mean that when you deliver your science or your technology to a business, then it has to have an appreciation about how it's going to fit in. 
I've got to stop. I won't go on too much about that one. This is the uh, technology readiness level. You will encounter it out there in the world. There is this strong belief that when you get to technology level 9, you've got a product. You haven't. You've got a capability, and that capability allows people to make a product. How much edge are you looking for? And this is a scary one for most people, because if it's close to exploitable, then you should be looking at times two on what is the, the uh, status quo about what normal is today. But if you're looking at five plus years, then you should be looking at something which is one to two orders of magnitude. And that's a big improvement. So don't waste time researching on bits which are going to give 10% or 20% improvement. Businesses will do that for themselves. You have to look at what's going to make big differences and then business will surely be interested in it. So, Einstein started off this Farago when he said, scientists investigate that which already is, engineers create that which has never been. It sounds a little bit dismissive of the role of science, but it doesn't. Here's some definitions that you'll find are quite useful. That's what a scientist does. That's what an engineer does. And Einstein didn't mention technicians, but technicians are the people who run production lines. They're the people who fix things which are broken, and they are expert practitioners of using tools. It's useful to know that because when you're aiming at one of these careers, then you need to have an idea about what it means. But to be an engineer is to create something that has never been. That thing has not been before. You're changing something which makes it unique. There is risks associated with any change, and an engineer's job is to manage those risks. A scientist isn't making a product. A scientist is making a technology available, and a technician is turning the wheel. A technician is using the, the skills and the methods, the tools that have been provided for him or her, and they're using it effectively. An engineer does not make a good technician. So business profiles, employee profiles, change during a business time. So here's the, the blue line is the heads, and they grow and then they die, as we've discussed. But what they don't tend to talk about is the profile of employees during that time. So scientists and engineers are in the startup, engineers and technicians are in the growth phase, but by the time you get to the maturity phase, you're looking at technicians and operatives. These are not the best people to help you out of that corner. When you suddenly realize that you've got an end to your business in near sight, then you have to do something about it. Those technicians and operatives are not the right skill group to carry that business forward to rescue the business. And that's something which has to be addressed. Because when, when that reinvention is required, you can frequently have 10,000, 100,000 people in the business, but none of them are suited to reinventing it. So I'm not going to spend time on that. Wise business advice to politicians basically says that business never listens to politicians because politicians have not got business experience. They are not interested in the same things. Political uh, business politicians love competitions. Business hates it. There's never a real business addressing market failures. Uh, market failures are the things that business can't make money out of, which by definition then for make, means if they're important, then they have to be provided by businesses which are not expected to make money. And politicians famously don't help you when things go wrong. So if as a result of their advice your business goes down, then they won't help you to survive. So businesses never heed the guidance of politicians. So know your science, know your customers. Do you really understand what they do? Do, they, do you really understand what they need? Do they really understand what they will get from you? Are you talking with the appropriate people? And is that a two-way process? Because it isn't just a case of transfer your knowledge to them or transfer their knowledge inward. It's a flow back on this process. To help your customer understand their future and to let them guide you in yours. It's a mutual relationship and it will turn into a valuable one for both of you if you do it. So conclusions, my last slide. <clears throat> Science and technologies enable products but are never products in their own right. 
It's the number one thing to remember. Businesses exist to profit from the exploitation of knowledge and know-how. That's why they're there. They're the, they're the core, they're the mine from which, um, from which economies are built. GDP comes from that. People ha are employed by companies. They take home their money, they spend it, they buy houses, they have children, and they encourage, they develop the economy. So in, businesses are a necessary part of that, but when they cease to exist, they fail. They fail to profit. And they're more fragile than you can imagine. That was the other last point on there. Businesses, they may be big, but they're always close to the edge. Getting a science into a product has to offer a significant end product advantage. Otherwise, they don't. It's got to introduce something which makes their product better than the existing alternative. Which also means that detached research is a useless thing. If you're doing it, you've got to keep it focused on at least one objective, which is commercial commercializable. It may turn into other things as well, but that's the thing that drives it forward. And finally, it's what you buy that funds this entire life cycle for everything inside that product, including the research, including the, the, um, the basic education. Everything is funded by what you buy. So I've got to say to you, buy more stuff because that stuff flows into the economy when you buy it, and that economy is what funds all of the activities throughout its life cycle. But at the same time, I don't advise you to loan money to buy that stuff. So I'm not an economist, I'm an engineer. At that point, thank you for listening, just about on time. Jai Feng.